Hey, audience, how's it going? Tiffany, uh, hey, Taylor, hey. joining me today. Uh, audience, thank you so much for joining us here today to talk about forecasting. Uh, while I give some time for the uh, for more people to join uh, here at this event, uh, audience, why don't you go into the chat and let us know where you're calling from? We love to see the global footprint of our community. My name is Eduardo. I am a marketing manager at Modern Sales Pros, and I'm speaking from New York City. But before we jump into the introductions for the speakers, I have an icebreaker. And I'm going to ask my speaker, if you were a type of apple, what type of apple would you be? Stephanie. Um, let's see. My favorite <laughs> kind of apple is Granny Smith, but I don't know what that says about me because they're sour. <laughs> <laughs> But they're really good. They're good for apple pies. Yes. <laughs> what about you, Taylor? I don't think this has any representation of me in any, <laughs> any way, but I'm going to go with the pink lady. That's just, I, I don't, that's my favorite apple. I don't know that necessarily is a representation of, of me, I but agree. they're delicious. They're small and, and they're, uh, they're, they're great. <laughs> that's my favorite type too. A uh, very good uh, uh, snack. Yeah. Um, all right, we have Anton from Finland. Only Anton is going to answer us on the chat. So audience, go ahead, answer us in the chat. Where are you calling from? We'd love to hear from you. Um, but let me um, introduce the topic. We're here today to talk about the sales forecasting uh, 2024 benchmarks. Uh, and I have an amazing panel of speakers here that will give you all the information you need today. As I mentioned, I work at Modern Sales Pros. Uh, and for those new here, welcome to MSP. We are the world's largest and finest community for more than 35,000 members in sales management, leadership, operations, and enablement. We are all about taking the road less travel and bringing you along for the journey. Our mission is to help you tackle um, tough questions and discover opportunities you might not even know exist. And we do this through uh, vibrant live sessions like this one you're about to experience. Uh, we have an engaging online forum and we have uh, summits every quarter and we are expanding array of in-person events nationwide. We have an event in San Francisco next week uh, in a boat. It's gonna be really fun. If you're not part of MSP yet, we will review your details after this event. And if you are fit to join us, we will extend an exclusive invite to join our community of modern sales professionals. Um, but let's focus on how to get the most out of this event here. So heads up, we are recording this session and we'll have some um, interactive questions for you. So audience, please make sure that you're using the, the chat over there uh, to talk with the speakers and send them a lot of questions. I was talking with them um, uh, backstage and they said they love answering questions about forecasting. So if you have any questions for your uh, next cycle, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll make sure to um, answer them. One thing that I didn't mention about MSP is that we also have the best partners in the business. So today we have exactly sponsoring this event. Um, Taylor and um, Stephanie will talk a little bit more about exactly in a few seconds. However, if you're here, if you like what they're saying about exactly, if you want to check it out, there's a request demo with our sponsor button at the top of this page. You can click this button and the team at exactly will reach out to you later today and you can see the magic happening. As I mentioned, my speakers here today, Stephanie and Taylor, uh, they're gonna tell you everything you need to know about forecasting, uh, but let's get them to introduce themselves. Um, Stephanie. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Stephanie Shaw. I'm the global forecasting strategist at Exactly. Um, so I do stuff with uh, help with customers, uh, best practices, our internal teams, um, work with sales leaders uh, pretty much uh, all day, every day, and um, and excited to be here to share some of our findings with you. That sounds fun. Uh, what about you, Taylor? Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so Taylor Wilding, Vice President of Sales here at Exactly. Uh, I oversee our new business at, uh, both in North America as well as our total business in Japan. And uh, so working with customers across the board, uh, new, new customers and future customers alike. So excited to be here and, and thanks for attending. That sounds really fun. So you work around the clock, North America and Japan, 24 hours working. Uh, that sounds really fun. Let's jump into the content. Stephanie, you have the slides right now. The mic is yours. I'm going to be listening backstage and taking a lot of notes to send a follow-up email to my audience later today. So you can take it from here. Uh, have some fun. Perfect. Thanks, Thank Eduardo. you, Eduardo. Yes. Um, before we jump in, um, just want to level set on exactly making sure, you know, a lot of you, if you've 
you know and are familiar with exactly, you probably think about us as uh, incentive compensation management, but really we are so much more than that. Um, so to kind of talk you through that, you know, we saw that businesses are faced with more challenges today than ever before. And really that forced sales leaders to really shift their mindset from that growth at all cost mentality to um, a more balanced approach. And with that change comes complications. So sales leaders trying to figure out how they're going to, um, they must think to be able to achieve that uh, revenue potential. Um, and so a lot of times it's, you know, sales leaders realizing we need to, you know, go away with the legacy processes and think more holistically, which is where exactly comes in. Um, to provide extensible solutions that are going to help organizations to really be able to break down the silos across the organization and teams and really start to change the way that you think about the way that you plan, design, manage, incent, and forecast efficiently and intelligently. So what we're doing is really aligning people, processes, and technology across that entire revenue ecosystem that is going to result in predictable, profitable, and ultimately sustainable growth. But today, as you know, we're here focusing on forecasting. So with exactly forecasting, what we're doing is leveraging historical data in AI and machine learning, which is, is all the rage. Um, to provide you with crucial insights that are going to help you be able to make the most informed decisions so that you can have risk surfaced, early warnings, be able to understand what those next best actions are that are going to drive consistent sales execution, help you understand what is the path to get me to my number so that I can forecast accurately. So today, the reason why we're here um, is because we've just released, um, as of this morning, this 2024 sales forecasting benchmark uh, report. And so Taylor and I wanted to sit down and kind of talk about some of the findings. So Taylor, thanks so much for, for joining me today um, as we talk through um, really what's happening in, in the, the world of forecasting. So you're a sales leader. As a VP of sales, you you talk to sales leaders all the time. You have your own experience. You know, what I'm curious to understand is, you know, are sales leaders hitting their numbers? Do they know how they're going to hit their numbers? And, you know, are you guys confident? What, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting in a mixed bag. I think that when we look at uh, who's hitting their numbers and who's confident, it's definitely the minority uh, majority of, of sales leaders out there are not hitting their numbers. And I think there's two different types of numbers to actually be thinking about. One is, of course, the budgeted number that your finance team, uh, fp &A team has provided you. And, and of course, is, is coming from the top, a corporate objective uh, revenue target. And then there's, of course, the call, right? What it is that you're forecasting, you're saying that you're going to hit and you're committing to the business. And, you know, of course, if you're missing, what we're seeing is we're we're getting to a point where it feels as though a lot of sales leaders are actually comfortable. And, and I use comfortable very loosely, of course, but they're getting a little comfortable with the fact of just hitting their call as opposed to the, the budgeted number. Um, and so what we're, what we're seeing out there is, is of course, how do we mend that gap? Uh, mm -hmm. Because the problem is, is actually we're seeing that people aren't even hitting the number that they're calling they're missing and the, the, the revenue is not as predictable as it once was uh, for various reasons. Uh, and so that's definitely a trend that we're seeing is that people are not that there's permission to miss the the budgeted number, but also that people are just not hitting their their forecasted number, um, mm -hmm. which, of course, leaves them short of that budgeted number by by you know bigger, bigger strides, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And in the fact that you, you said that, I mean, it is it is alarmingly, you know, um, you know, surprising how much they're not hitting the number. What we found in this report is that four in five um, sales and finance leaders are missing the forecast in the past year in that over half of them have missed two or more times. So thinking, you know, there's only four quarters in, in the year and over half are missing at least two times. That's pretty significant. You know, what, what what's your take on 
um, why folks are missing their numbers so often? Well, first and foremost, I think that we all know that the dynamic market that we're in has people more risk averse. And so looking at the at the deals and understanding the risks within those those deals, to, 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 regardless of what industry you're in or selling into, what persona, everyone is is a bit more risk averse in understanding what those commitments are. Nobody's necessarily losing their job for uh, purchase, not purchasing software, if you will, right? Um, but at the same time, if you purchase the wrong software, then you very well uh, might uh, lose your job. And so we're just seeing people a lot more risk, uh, you know, risk averse and, and, and afraid of what will happen if they make a change. And so uh, we're seeing that pressure coming from multiple angles from buying committees. Uh, there's no longer, you know, single, uh, single threaded purchases out there. I mean, I think that's been a thing of the past, but we haven't seen that in quite some time. And so being able to identify those trends and understanding where the risk lies within deals in order to make course corrections and therefore, you know, calling a deal into or or not calling a deal into, uh, you know, your, your deal line, uh, for instance, is something that I think is missing and understanding what's behind the curtains and asking surface level questions. You need to actually see the data uh, these days and see the interactions and see the data points, whether or not legal has started, whether or not, you know, search attributes that you know based on time frame should or shouldn't be achieved. Uh, and I think for that reason, we're starting to see, you know, those misses because what we used to say is, uh, you know, these deals are, are good once legal starts. That typically is not happening these days. And, and especially when, with regards to the timeline as to which they're happening, which I think is, is actually part of why we're seeing misses in, in people's forecasts more than not is really the timeline. It's not necessarily the if they're going to purchase, it's just as much as when they're going to purchase that people are having a hard time identifying. Absolutely. When you think, you know, as you look at before and you think the number of times that you're missing, it's like the mm -hmm. The whole plan budget is all centered around that financial plan. And so as you miss these quarters, it's like we don't have the revenue coming in to support the. So you see that it's like it, we're we're getting our budget taken away to buy new solutions, but we're you know, so that's that's delaying the timeline. So what could have been, you might have thought, oh, we're going to close this in Q2 ends up being, well, we we missed our number. So we got our budget taken away. So now it's been pushed to Q3. We still want to buy, but we need to be successful on our end. Yeah. But then it's that double-edged sword of, but we don't have the visibility to be successful, to be able to hit our number. Um, and we can't get the budget till we- Well, it's interesting- it's interesting, Stephanie, because one of the riskiest things within a deal, regardless of what you're selling and who you're selling into, is to be single threaded, right? Have that one single uh, point of contact. And so I would ask the same thing as to when you're formulating a forecast from a top down perspective or bottoms up for that matter, is looking at one single data point and, and truly listening and, and using your gut instinct is one thing. And, and there's always going to be a thing, especially for sales leaders, there's a reason why they're in that position. Um, but not being single threaded with your data points as well, right? How do you triangulate and, and understand push rates and win rates by rep, by industry, by uh, product that you're selling, et cetera. And so I think that that's playing a big part as well is that people are, are relying on their gut solely or, or single data points. Um, and really you have to use multiple data points in order to uh, formulate or decide whether or not something is, is you know predictable revenue or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. So, you know, we think about the, the, how often that organizations are missing the number, sales leaders are missing that. You know, the other part is thinking about how far off are they from missing mm -hmm. their number. Um, and what we found is that over half of sales leaders um, found that their forecasts were off by at least 10% or more. And you can see in this slide, you know, how that breaks down. Um, I know. Let's dig into the psyche a little bit, as as you think sales leaders like wow, the pressure on a sales leader is enormous. Um, can you speak to kind of that push and pull um, that goes on in a sales leader's mind? Well, I think there's there's a, a couple of things to go off of there, Stephanie, and one of them is of course the deals that make up the call to begin with, and and having the number of deals. I think pipeline is is one thing that people are 
are having a challenge with across the board. All the customers that I've talked to or future customers that I talk to are, you know, not working with as much pipeline as maybe they, they were in the past. And so being able to have your A deals, your B deals, or your however you call them, right? I, I don't want to get into nomenclature because some people call them different things. But if you think about your A deals, those deals that you're cementing and calling that are going to come in 100%. And then, of course, you know, those B deals, which are maybe your backup deals or things that you're progressing. Um, having those available is something that we're not seeing a whole lot of um, anymore and having that backfill and ability to, to get there. And so when we think about it, there's it's not just about hitting the number uh, or being within a certain degree of, of accuracy on the you know bottom end, but also what happens if you exceed that uh, number, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the ramifications that has, if you're consistently overachieving as well, there could be some detrimental effects to the organization because maybe you could have uh, you could add extra headcount or or extra resources or things along those lines. But in general, we're definitely seeing uh, some difficulties and in, in, in getting to those numbers. Uh, and of course, people are trying to save face. They're trying to look good, and 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 of course, ultimately that ends up making them look bad at the end. And and if you have data to support why you're calling a number and potentially even a lower number than what it is that is budgeted you at least have some justification to it um, mm -hmm. and be able to provide that to the organization so that you can also make course corrections along the way and not be satisfied once again with with missing either the number or the budget. But how do you iterate upon your current, uh, you know, work streams and, and, and initiatives in order to, to help meet those uh, objectives? Absolutely. And that's, you know, really where like that data comes in that it's like, at least, you know, when you're calling a number below what the plan is right out of the gate, it's, we're alleviating any surprises. But then when you look at the fact that it's the number of sales leaders that unfortunately, because they don't have the data in front of them, they don't have the consistent processes that they mm -hmm. don't understand the path to hit their, their forecast. They don't understand where their risk is. So it's, yeah, I mean, it must be, be these are difficult conversations to be having with the CRO and with um, the board as as you're not only missing the plan, but you're also missing your forecast. Um, yeah. So it's well, it, it's interesting, too. I'm seeing Bill's comment, you know, about what the discrepancy is between week one and week 13. Um, I, that's definitely something that is front of mind for most sales leaders and I'm sure revenue operations and, and finance and cross functionally. Right. Is that starting point where you're at and then, of course, where you're going to finish. And I think that's really, I'm not certain about the data on this, uh, on the report, but we'll get, get the answer there. But that's really what the ultimate goal is, right? Is to be within uh, three to 3% 3 of your initial quarter call. And oftentimes, you know, we're providing a call, you know, well ahead of the quarter as well, based on, on how things are shaping up in the pipeline that's out there. So uh, making sure that that is continuously narrowing, right? You're narrowing uh, in on, on your business as the quarter goes, as opposed to widening that gap is, is the objective. Uh, meaning that you're, you know, deal back to a certain percentage at the beginning of a quarter. And of course, everyone's business is different, but then of course, how you're progressing uh, towards those numbers throughout the quarter. And like I said, narrowing that gap, as opposed to uh, widening it is where we're seeing a lot of our our customers coming to us and looking for the ability to once again, narrow that gap of uh, start of quarter to end of quarter um, and where they're landing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the importance to have as much visibility as possible to understand what that that call is going to be. How close are we going to get to the number so I can call that on day one? Um, because ultimately I have to be calling a number on day one. And, and the farther I am away from that number, whether it's ahead or below, is gonna it's going to make me look bad as the sales leader to the CRO, to the board, if I don't know my business, um, which is challenging. And hopefully, yeah, as it gets to week 13, it is, it is getting more and more accurate. But but the goal with a forecasting solution is to get you there on, on day one. So you're making that accurate um, call right out of the gate. Um, well, and two is, is understanding, of course, what the trends are within your business, right? What you're, if you are consistently missing by a certain degree, uh, you know, per the previous slide is if that's consistent at the same level, is there's obviously a trend there that you need to course correct and find out where those course corrections are. And so how do you triangulate or find pinpoint where the corrections are, are necessary? So being able to identify those trends, surface them and, and better yet make them actionable is where, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a solution like exactly can definitely help. Absolutely. If I see I'm always off like 10% on week one, and that's been the consistent mm -hmm. trend over the last four quarters, then I know 
like probably the call that I'm making this quarter on day one is probably going to be similar to yeah. that. Um, well, yeah. Well, why is it going to be different this time, right? What are we doing differently? And it might be the deals that you have and your confidence in them, or it might be mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, you pushed from previous uh, period or what have you. So there's, there are definitely some reasons perhaps, but yeah, if it, if it's more than a few quarters in a row or periods in a row, then then clearly you have a trend on your hands. And especially when you think about, you know, first line leaders and or reps making a, a call, first line leaders, second line leaders, et cetera, that identifying those trends from an individual basis and then on an aggregate basis is, is insightful information to be able to action. Yep, absolutely. So when you think about forecasting data, you know, it's used to make the most important decisions, you know, across the business, um, planning, budgets, you know, the forecast, all, all of that. Um, so, you know, one of the things that came out in this study is that um, the need and the challenges around collaboration and breaking down silos across sales and finance teams, leading 97% of sales and, and uh, finance leaders to say that they need to work better together. Um, you know, curious to, to get your take on why you think this is so important. I mean, it's no surprise uh, whatsoever that that 97% of, of leaders said that they need sales and finance to work better together. I think there's a couple of, of pieces to that. One, first and foremost, just like the buying committees these days are much broader, uh, so are the selling committees, if you will, right? The teams that go out there and, and, and win these deals. And so uh, I think that it's definitely revenue as a team sport more now than it, than it probably ever has been. And uh, what I mean by that is having uh, cooperation across the organization from uh, where, where you're at within uh, commercials and legal and, and everything else and having that insight, right? There might be mm -hmm. deals at times that uh, a sales rep or a sales leader is, is saying is going to come in at a certain time, but without having maybe, you know, maybe you haven't even started legal yet and legal's in the dark, or maybe you haven't, you know, scoped the solution if it's a SaaS solution that you're offering to the market and you haven't scoped it out yet. Uh, those are things that, you know, otherwise, if you don't have a system uh, to kind of bring those alerts or, or, or risks to, to light, then that's definitely something that you want to be able to, you know, collaborate on. And so when we say that, you know, when everyone says that they need sales and finance to work better together, I think it goes well beyond finance, to be honest with you. Um, and it's really a matter of, of having everybody on the same page. And, and there's an order of operation. Right, as knowing that what a good deal looks like, and by segment, by product, by industry, whatever it may be, that uh, being able to remain consistent as possible. We know that it, none of these sales cycles are cookie cutters these days, but at least be able to identify those trends when legal should have been started, and and then what does that, how does that correlate to a close date and things along those lines? Once again, it's not necessarily that if a deal is going to be won, it's it's a win. The deal is going to be won more than anything, and so identifying that proper timeline based on historical trends is really where. I think sales and finance come together. Um, and then of course, what the planning looks like, if you're consistently missing um, on your forecast, that I, one of the things that I think we hear from our, our customers and our future customers as well is that it impacts the way that their FP&A team is planning for the next year, right? And so those consistent misses, you lose trust as a sales organization or the finance uh, team might, FP&A team might lose trust in the sales organization to hit that number. And so they're planning with a little bit of a, uh, a dartboard, if you will. And so being able to be more accurate, bring data to the table and, and plan effectively is really important, um, you know, for both privately held, but probably just as if not more important for those publicly traded companies out there um, to be able to report to the street and, and accurately um, on a consistent basis. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how you said too the, you know, the collaboration, not just sales and finance. It's like when you, you think about the fact of, of, being able to understand, you know, that collaboration between marketing, between, you know, making sure do we have the pipeline that we need, you know, in terms of, of legal, like as it's, you know, if we've got all the deals that are closing in the last week of the month or last week of the quarter, that's a lot of resources, a lot of demand that's put on your legal team and making sure that like they know what's coming in implementation. You think of the customer journey of, you know, for the PS teams of like, what's going to getting ready to be implemented of, okay, do we have the resources so that when we close these deals, we, we follow through on what we're saying and that we are providing this seamless, smooth transition into becoming a customer so that we can, uh, you know, hopefully keep 
a customer for life and start delighting them right out of the gate. So that collaboration on everyone needing to know what does that that forecast look like, where's the pipeline, what's coming yeah. in, what's going to close is so crucial. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up the customer for life because I think the thing that people often think of when they think about forecasting is, of course, sales. And they think about new business pursuits or, or ARR specifically or, or whatever uh, type of revenue that is that you're you're capturing. But ultimately, too, especially when we're talking about SaaS, is what about the GRR components, right? What about the retention and, and identifying where the risk is within those uh, opportunities and, and things that you're pulling in from and, and integration from other source systems, right? Maybe it's a, uh, you know, customer success system like a Gainsight uh, type of uh, a system and being able to bring those triggers or those identifiers in on those risky uh, accounts, how do you then forecast as well your, you know, your retention? Um, and that's where really this becomes more than just sales forecasting. It goes well beyond it. This, of course, benchmark report is ge geared towards sales forecasting, but ultimately, you know, and especially today is holding on to those customers and those dollars um, is is critical for an organization's success. Yeah, oh, couldn't agree more. All right, so um, one of the the last things um, before we we jump, I know there's some great questions going on in the in the chat. Um, just thinking about you know forecasting for for the future. You know, a couple of other takeaways that that we saw was that. Um, what sales leaders are really wanting in the future. Um, and they really talked a lot about leveraging historical data and, and needing automation, being able to conduct a better postmortem and understand from my, mm -hmm. our, our losses, from our wins, you know, um, what, how do we learn from those? And, and being able to understand in terms of competitive deals, how do we perform so that we can get better? You know, um, curious as as you think about this data, you know, why is it so important to have that at your fingertips? And, and as I think about us being able to do this within exactly forecasting, how has it helped you tailor um, to, to be more effective as a sales leader to understand and have that data available? Yeah, I think once again, it goes back to the information that's presented and looking at, especially the momentum, going back to the not if, but when a deal is, is looking good, but at times, of course, you're gonna lose as well. And so looking holistically and in one single pane of glass to understand what happened within an opportunity for anywhere from, uh, you know, the number of emails and the number of meetings and the number of uh, people engaged and the number of, you know, red lines that were exchanged, the number of, uh, you know, references that were necessary and be able to look at that with one a single pane of glass and understand what's happening uh, in there is, is really critical. And so being able to look at that uh, to plan for the future and understand how to, you know, affect or change your sales process. Not too often, of course, but uh, just make slight tweaks. I think that if you continue to do the same things over and over and expect different results, we all know that's the definition of insanity and there's no different within, uh, within sales and, and forecasting specifically. And so being able to look at uh, uh, the opportunities that you're winning holistically and the trends there, uh, for one, you know, where is your, where are your wins coming from? What is the, what is the pipeline source? Is it coming from lead from, uh, your lead gen organization, sales organization, partners, marketing, whatever it may be and understanding where those are coming from. So you can double down on the things that are working and you can iterate upon the things that aren't working, um, or store just straight up, stop doing them. Um, being able to surface that information and once again, make it actionable is important. And at the same time, some of the things is you know pre-pipeline you know is is how do you actually affect the behaviors of your sales reps mm -hmm. in order to go after the right accounts and surfacing information from multiple sources for one being you know intent data whether or not you're pulling it from a zoom info or a six cents or wherever else you might be getting your intent data or most uh importantly maybe it's multiple sources in order to make sure that the fidelity of that data is is correct um is is really something that that is important and, and if you can surface that information then you're going to increase your win rates by by making sure you're going after the right types of accounts at the right time when there is that intent. And of course, how do you progress the intent as well? Um, but ultimately what it comes down to, and I'm seeing some of the comments or questions in the chat is that we are at the liberty of what it is that the sellers are putting into the system oftentimes. And so one of the nice things about having a, a solution and, and luckily we're able to drink our own champagne, eat our own dog food, however you want to, categorize it here at exactly is that, you know, we're able to see firsthand the effects of, of things automatically being tracked, 
uh, within exactly forecasting uh, mm -hmm. anywhere from emails to, to meetings that are happening uh, to uh, you know, who's being added and people being added automatically to the contacts based off of who's in the email and, and things to make sure that we're tracking all those uh, elements and our customers are seeing it and, and talking about it as well and the benefits that it's giving. And so uh, it's not just about the data that's going in, but also providing that prescriptive approach as to when and why you should put the data in, right? Based on certain triggers and alerts and, and being proactive. We all need those nudges um, in, in life, let alone within forecasting in order to, to follow a sales process that we know works um, based on, once again, the historical trends. And so that's where I think when we look at forecasting for the future, it starts with 100% who you're going after, making sure you're getting your ICP into your pipeline, and then ultimately, you know, managing and, and running the sales process according to whatever it is your process at your organization is, and following the proper steps that you know is the formula or the recipe to win, uh, and be able to have that be a repeatable process, but at the same time, be able to iterate upon uh, that based on the fact that every account, every opportunity and every pursuit is not necessarily a cookie cutter approach. Absolutely. And you think, you know, it's it's automating what can be automated, but it's like because you are at the mercy of the rep of putting data in, you know, what we've found is that it's it's making it as easy as possible for the rep to enter that data so that it's not mm -hmm. a headache for them. It doesn't take a lot of time. But I think what in the past had happened is reps were putting data in and then organizations weren't leveraging that data. So it's like, I'm, I'm taking right. the time to enter it, but then I'm in a pipeline review call and you're asking me all the questions that I've put in, like all the data is here and, and I am going through. So, so what we found is like on the pipeline review, like when the data is there in like the score, the opportunity is scored and there's no alerts on that opportunity. It's, I'm, I'm going to, the reps are going to be in the hot seat less. So then the reps mm -hmm. see that, Ooh, there's a benefit in me entering this data. It means I spend less time in the hot seat. I like that as a rep. So I'm going to get all my alerts done. I'm going to have my updates completed so that yep. uh, I, I don't have to answer as many questions. Cause at the end of the day, the reps, you know, they're telling you what you want to hear. And, and when the data is in the system, then you get to see the insights. You get to understand what's happening with those opportunities. And then you can have the objective look of that as well. Um, and so that really helps with yeah. that, that forecasting process. Yeah, I think it's interesting because being able to bring data in from like conversational intelligence tools for one, right? You're able to see what actual topics and especially with the AI that's coming out of some of those, the gongs and the choruses of the world. Uh, those those integrations that are available and, and bringing those in, be able to see what uh, actual conversations happen when those meetings happen. And, and it's not, of course, up to the rep to summarize that that interaction. It's right there for the sales leaders and everyone else to, to see and then to collaborate and coach upon as well. Right. It's not just about that deal and, and progressing that deal, but it's how do you, of course, continue to grow as as a seller and, and progress um, in the next opportunity. And so the interesting thing about these things here that we see um, that, that were derived from the survey, future planning, diverse outlook, real-time data, customized reporting, comparative views, and automated reminders are all, you know, just happen to be things that we know that, you know, a tool like Exactly Forecasting can provide. And um, I can't imagine, you know, I've, I've been a sales rep in my future or my past life where, you know, I was pulling information into you know, a quip document as an example, in order to have inline editing, because you're not able to do that within Salesforce. And sometimes it's just those little things that make the big things happen. And so being able to leverage a tool to provide inline editing and, and be able to see what's happening within those deals, the trends up and down, all within one view is really uh, insightful. And once again, it's, it's a system of engagement. Uh, and so being able to use, uh, you know, a forecasting solution, like exactly um, as a system of engagement, whereas you're still going to have your system of record um, with with like a Salesforce or a Dynamics or whatever it may be, or multiple Salesforce instances for that matter, and be able to bring that all into one view instead of multiple Salesforce instances, you have so many benefits uh, to the organization to be working off of uh, unified and customized reporting as well. Yeah, no, love that. Um, so in terms of uh, some of the questions that we've gotten over here in the chat, yeah. um, one of them, um, so I'm sure they would love for you to talk a little bit more about this. Um, 
kind of spoke to how close uh, a forecast accuracy. Um, and they, they, uh, Bill um, Cantor said within 3% of the initial call, is this really achievable other than through luck? So just curious to have you talk, Taylor, more about, um, I know this has been reality for you. So yeah. uh, to speak on how, how luck, but luck isn't part of it, not all the time. Yeah, I think it's very interesting as a practice and, and being consistent with it and looking at the data that it's presented once again, looking at things both in two different, you know, when we think about triangulating the data, you, you have your bottoms up forecast and you have what the reps are calling. And that's, of course, taken into account. You've got your first line leaders and what they're calling and you take that into account. But then you look at it from a tops down perspective and you look about, you know, from a beginning of quarter pipeline perspective. And what you typically need from a coverage uh, coverage model in order to hit a number, you take a data point like that, um, which is accessible and, and, and available um, within a tool like Exactly Forecasting. But then, of course, you look at, you know, things like uh, sales categories. So if you're using something like commit, best case, or upside and, and pipeline, and looking throughout the quarter, especially at the beginning of that quarter, based on the category that those deals are sitting in, uh, what you know the push out rate is and, and looking at it not only on an aggregate level but by a rep perspective right if you have uh, reps that typically push deals out um, and and don't hold to to the close dates but then also individual win rates and, and corporate win rates as well and then be able to come up with an expected bookings amount there uh, but then also using that but also the stage progression right so based on the stages that you're utilizing stage you know five five through two if you will um, and understanding what the same data points are right push out rates expected win rates etc and then all of a sudden when you're looking at it from a bottoms up perspective and you're coming up with a number being able to have what i consider a sanity check and looking at the expected bookings from both of the you know stage progress stage and stage and category perspective is you know when you have a number in your head based on your intuition and your gut and then you go in and you say well here's what the data is also telling me that gives you a different level of confidence in calling that number than if the number is far off. And then if the number is far off or it is off, that's when you, of course, go and you look at, okay, where am I missing or what am I thinking better, uh, you know, optimistically about within, within my pipeline and being able to do a deeper dive inspection and coaching on those opportunities to, to progress them. Right. Um, and so definitely having that. And then of course, the last thing, there and maybe not the last thing but the other uh piece of that puzzle is of course ai and machine learning and so in having the ability for your historical trends to then surface and and tell you whether or not a deal is is you know good to close or not good to close um is also a good data point when you're thinking about from a bottoms up perspective and how you're going to arrive at that overall number that you came to uh with the with the top down um data crunching and, and, and visualizations. And so being able to see those individual deals that the AI is saying, yes, this is going to come in and no, it's not. You know, if you're calling a deal in yourself that the AI is not, then you go and you make some course corrections and figure out what you might be missing and vice versa. So um, I've, you know, like you said, I've personally been able to achieve uh, achieve this feat um, and definitely is is with leveraging data, triangulating and being able to, to have that data at my fingertips um, it just becomes a bit of a practice. And, and once you get going on it, it's uh, you can't live without it, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's it's definitely a crutch that is beneficial. And, and of course, my gut is running things, uh, but it's definitely, like I said, a sanity check in my mm -hmm. eyes. Well, that's where it's like the merging of art and science, that it's like you mm -hmm. need that gut. Like that's wisdom, that's years of experience, yep. but having the, the, the science there to help you understand is this realistic? What have we done yeah. consistently? What are the trends? Um, and even like internally um, in what our customers have done is really teaching their reps and their first line managers to think the same way in surfacing yeah. that same data so that as a rep is forecasting a, a certain amount, they've got that data right in front of them to say, well, what have I consistently done quarter over quarter? Like, is this realistic? Um, you know, and so to kind of have that pushing back at them so that they have that objective look um, is is crucial. Yeah. And, and I talked about legal and, and other departments as well having an influence, right? The ability to 
have as well the perspective of my solutions consultants and my legal team and my professional services team as to whether or not they think the deal is going to come in um, as well, right? And, and so talking about that cross-functional collaboration is having different people's perspectives on, on whether or not that's going to happen. That's not always visible to the reps, but from a sales leader, you know, having that visibility and then, of course, asking for their deeper questions if I have something that I'm thinking is going to come in and be able to cut, check my gut with their gut uh, with great experience as well is, is also insightful. But without having that as a component as to how you're coming up with your arriving to your, your call from a, a bottoms up perspective, it's, uh, it's pretty challenging to, to understand how other functions within the organization feel about particular deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense for sure. Um, a couple of the, the kind of comments in the chat have been about activity, um, detail, like what's needed. We've had, you know, medic has been um, brought up a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, but there were a, a couple of, of questions of, you know, what, what data is needed. So when you're looking at opportunities, um, in, in kind of what is, what is your process of like, what, what data you want to have available? I know we, we automatically bring emails and meetings and chorus, um, uh, activity in, but what additional mm -hmm. data are you looking at to make those, um, you know, insights? Yeah. So, uh, I think momentum, uh, is really important as well. So looking at how we're progressing and, and the deal age, you know, I know, exactly what our deal age was for by segment um, and by product from you know our previous period and then the period before that and so being able to see that information and, and leverage that and understanding the momentum that we have within particular deals or or also who is or isn't engaged right so if we are not high enough within an organization within the buying committee we don't have for instance that exactly if we don't have a controller or a cfo engaged at any point in, in time uh, the chances of us winning that opportunity are, are much slimmer um, than not. And so being able to, to understand those types of things, of course, you know, the dollar amount, right? So one of the things that really is painful as a, as a sales leader is if you have a certain pipeline that you're working off of and you're anticipating, um, you know, a portion of that closing, and then all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and let's say you've lost, you know, half a million dollars from your pipeline, where did that go? Did we lose it? Did we, uh, did it push out? What happened to it? Be able to see those trends over time and, and where your pipeline has gone with waterfalls and, and trends there is, is super insightful. So, um, but on a deal by deal basis, right? Timeline, uh, who's engaged, deal age, uh, legal and infosec, whether or not they have or haven't started. I'm talking, of course, from the lens of a SaaS company right now, but of course our customers have other things, right? With hardware and maybe they're um, looking at different elements of, of their of their sales process. Maybe mm -hmm. there needs to be an on-site visit that's necessary in order to scope the, the project or whatever it may be. And having those triggers, whatever's important to your business as a part of that uh, scoring, right? And be able to have a score that's uh, showing you what, what the health of that deal is. It really all comes down to, to formulating that scorecard. And once you formulated that scorecard based on your business and the sales process, then that then allows you to have those triggers to impart, right? Oh, we've got an unrealistic close date on this opportunity that alerts the sales rep. Why is that an unrealistic? Because maybe something, a step was skipped or maybe because it's really unrealistic and, and need to make an adjustment, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely as much of the data that can be automated and brought into the system, the more efficient it is. So things like uh, gong and chorus, it might not necessarily update the fields, but at least you know it happened and you know the data that happened within. Um, and so therefore you have the ability to at least reference it within a single pane of glass and even review the calls um, mm -hmm. directly within a tool. So you're not jumping back and forth, but you're, you're staying in one spot is really helpful. Yes, great. All right, well, thanks so much, Taylor. I think we've gotten to pretty much all of the questions, unless I'm missing any, but I'm pretty sure that we have. Um, so if we miss any, I'm, I apologize. Um, so uh, one of the questions that was brought up at the very beginning was, um, how do we get our hands on this benchmark uh, uh, report? Mm -hmm. So um, that is going to be, um, there's a link that I believe that um, we're going to share in the chat. Um, 
Jan just put that in there. Thanks, Jan. Um, so the link is available. It is not gated. Um, we want you to have access to that. So um, definitely take a look at that review. Um, and we would love to engage with you. So, you know, um, feel free. There's, you know, requested demo um, is at the top of the screen. Um, and, uh, you know, Taylor, I just appreciate you jumping on here with me today. All of your um, insight has been um, super uh, uh, important and helpful. Um, so yeah, appreciate it. And with, you know, to the, to the audience, I would say that regardless of whether or not you're looking at a sales forecasting tool or not, I, you know, I think that or feel that some of the things that we've talked about today uh, undoubtedly will affect the, some of the decisions you make over the next 12 to 18 months. And so I would love to just spend some time with you outside of the fact that you may or may not be interested in, in purchasing exactly forecasting to talk about some of the trends and things that you're seeing out there and, and find ways to, uh, you know, deliver value outside of just a uh, solution. And, and of course I'm looking to learn as well. So um, open door and, and would love to hear from me. I know that Eduardo uh, put my LinkedIn in the, in the chat would love to connect um and share you know rub elbows with like-minded professionals so appreciate the time and, and everything here absolutely it looks like anton says uh the euro football <laughs> yeah. uh yes is it is it england uh or holland yes exciting stuff we have an office in england so i'm gonna i'm gonna go for for england uh today but uh, <laughs> That sounds good. Um, thank you all so much for those insights. Audience, thank you so much for your participation. You are the best for MSP. Uh, for everyone attending, again, this event was recorded. Uh, we could not let all this knowledge that Taylor and Stephanie gave us go to the ether. So I will be sending a follow-up email later today with the recording link. Uh, again, the link thing for the both speakers. And um, if you liked what they said today, there's the request demo with our sponsor button at the top of the page. And I will also uh, include that button into the follow-up email and also the um the report that came out uh, we have the link right here in the chat so make sure to check out the report and make sure to connect with the speakers uh via linkedin because they would love to hear from you um thank you all so much for joining us today speakers thank you so much uh we will we'll hang out backstage for a little bit while the msp team make sure that the audience receive the follow-up email with everything that i mentioned before um and again thank you exactly for sponsoring this event today um audience i will see you next time pleasure thank thanks for having us and everyone thanks for attending absolutely thank you bye bye